you are about to have to hear today's news talk and the voice of freedom. That's what this country is all about. Today's news talk TNT. What do CEOs of groups like Spotify, Citigroup, and Pfizer, of course, which we just mentioned, have in common with moguls such as Eric Schmidt and Peter Thiel? Well, they're at Bilderberg 2024, of course, and this meeting is now taking place in Madrid, Spain, uh, to a lot of silence out there. Uh, not a lot of coverage, even in the alternative media, and quite frankly, to me, this is the meeting of meetings for the year. Joining us to discuss is somebody who has been on the beat for much longer than even Jason Burmis, somebody who is a protege of the late, great James Tucker. Jim Tucker really blew Bilderberg wide open. And somebody I haven't seen in way too many years, Mark Anderson. Mark, thank you so much for joining us. Bilderberg 2024 is here. Obviously, one of the most bizarre years ever. We're on the heels of the Trump conviction. Um, this this bad boy isn't really stacked with U.S. politicians, more national security figures, and uh, Fareed Zakari and Stacey Abrams for some reason. <laughs> but you've got directors of national intelligence. You've got the heads of NATO here this year. And just to go over really quickly the press release topics down the line, we have the state of AI, AI safety, changing faces of biology, climate, future warfare, geopolitical landscape, Europe's, Europe's economic challenges, U.S. economic challenges, U.S. political landscape, Ukraine and the world, Middle East, China, and Russia. So what say you, Mark? Well, it's a very interesting year. It is great to see you, Jason. Long time, and it's not intended. Um, it's, it's, Of course, it's their 70th meeting in 70 years, something of a milestone for them. Some people thought they'd fade into obscurity, but I think they had secret smaller meetings, call-out sessions in 20 and 21 when they were allegedly closed for the reason of COVID. I don't really buy that. But at any rate, there's so many ways you could go with this in the time allotted. Um, AI is a recurring topic. In fact, there are lots of recurring topics. Uh, I was quantifying everything today. First of all, you have about 35 of the 140 people who are government officials. A few of them are former, but most of them are current government officials. That's a full 25% of Bilderberg right now that is government officials. And that's always been the biggest problem, Jason. You could have a country club of pure privateers, right? Just corporate people. And they could break all the bread they want, drink all the wine they want, eat all the caviar they want. But as soon as you add the press and the government, you have a, a tremendous problem here because government officials cannot, according to their oaths, obey this ridiculous Chatham House rule, go in there and shed their government function for a few days as if they're a snake shedding their skin. It just doesn't work that way. Once you're a sworn government official, you are that 24 hours a day, 365, until you're no longer in that government position. So they go in there, and that's what makes this so unlawful. That's the key word. Conspiratorial and secretive in many ways, yes, but it's unlawful for these government officials to break bread and undoubtedly make deals with these privateers. And then the media that's there, instead of honoring their viewers and listeners and readers, leaves their public function at the door, goes in there and breaks bread with the powerful instead of speaking truth to power. How in the hell can you speak truth to power if you're joining the power structure? See, this is, this is where Bilderberg goes off the rails. If you mix all that together, it's unlawful. The, the uh, potential for insider trading is off the, off, the, uh, off the rails. And no matter which way you slice it, Government officials and media should not be there. If they were subtracted, we could let these privateers meet all they want, play all the golf they want, buy all the whores they want, whatever they want to do. And so this has always been, as Tucker would explain to me and as we went over, this has always been the fundamental problem with Bilderberg. It ties into the Logan Act, which is a very old law, but it does tie into that as, at least in a tangential kind of way. But um, yeah, lots of interesting topics, but Bilderberg is an unlawful a conglomeration and gathering of pre-existing organizations that in turn form a new organization called the Bilderberg Group. And they have sort of a Congress of these organizations, the CFR, the Brookings Institution, Pfizer, Albert Borla is there for the second or third year in a row. 
And another thing that's odd, and I'm sure you agree, Jason, is when you look at the topics, I think there are 13 this year. Uh, the most they ever had in recent years was 14 in Washington, D.C. two years ago. When you look at the topics um, and then you look at the list of attendees, the, the, the disciplines and backgrounds of the list of the attendees is far broader than the topics there. Isn't it strange that Albert Borler would be there and there's no obvious pandemic or medical thing on the on the on the um, agenda? So why is Albert Borla there if there's no pandemic or obvious medical or pharmaceutical topic on there? The reason would be is that the list is not all inclusive of what they're talking about. That's the well, only I would way also to... say, Mark, I, I would also say changing biology, changing faces of biology. Uh, when we are talking about the mRNA technology, uh, Pfizer has kind of been at the forefront of the distribution and propaganda center. Uh, like you said, this is about the third year in a row he's been there. And what was perplexing to me is I expected that AI was going to be on the junket. Uh, obviously, it's in the top two this year. Sam Altman's not there this year, at least in an official capacity. He was there for the first time last year. And open AI is continuing to make deals to this day. You know, you just mentioned the media. We've got representatives uh, from Politico and The Atlantic just at the tippity top, uh, and that's far from all of it. But when you look at the narratives that they're pushing and how they're doing it. It's not just through the media. It is through these corporate entities. I suspect that's why you're seeing CEOs of Coca-Cola there, why you're seeing the CEOs of uh, Spotify there. But uh, like I said, with the AI in particular, uh, you've got Alex Karp and Peter Thiel there. And Alex Karp and Peter Thiel are the heads of Palantir. Just earlier this week, Alex Karp was at one of these military industrial complex trade shows talking about the future of AI and warfare and Palantir. And Palantir is really this uh, pseudo intelligence front. It's software for Five Eyes. Uh, I think people would be remiss if they don't realize what's going on right now in Israel, when you talk about Lavender AI, that is absolutely a subsidiary of what these guys are doing with Palantir and their modern warfare. In fact, future warfare also on the docket. So AI is being pushed. I think that they've got the changing biology and people like Fareed Zakaria there for that reason. You know, uh, he's their inside man at CNN far from the first time he's there. One of the surprising returns to me is Stacey Abrams who made her uh, first Bilderberg appearance pre-COVID-1984. And I thought really she would be a one or a two off. Uh, but she is here yet again. I think this is either her third or fourth Bilderberg conference. What capacity do you think Stacey Abrams is there? Maybe in relation to the Demo Democratic Party in general? Uh, that's entirely possible. Um, there's, yeah, that's, she's at the very top, CEO Sage Works Production. I haven't had a chance to look up what SageWorks production is actually about these days. But, um, yeah, we could go different directions with this. Um, AI has been a topic, for example, every year, 27, 20, 2017, 2018, 2019. They took the break again in 2020, 2020, uh, excuse me, in 2022, last year in Lisbon in 23, and this year again. So AI has been consistent ever since 2017 in Virginia. So that, that is a huge thing. And they've been looking at uh, disinformation. And of course, the media and social media companies and the the, uh, the bought off press that is there is very Mark, we got to take a break. But I remember yeah. when they yeah. talked about the post-truth world. And I believe we've been living in that post-truth world for yeah. some time. And it's only getting pushed further to the brink. We're going to take a break for the headlines. More on Bilderberg 2024 with Mark Anderson. More TNT after this. Okay, everybody, listen up. Big news. Big news. For real big news. Here we go. Now, TNT Radio News. For TNT, this is James O'Neill. Donald Trump has been found guilty on all counts in his historic hush money trial. The jury, consisting of seven men and five women, convicted the former president on 34 counts of falsifying business records. This verdict follows five weeks of dramatic evidence and testimony from 22 witnesses. This case marks the first time a former U.S. president has faced a criminal trial. 
Trump, the presumptive Republican presidential candidate, is set to challenge Joe Biden in November's election. Why not give TNT Radio a follow? We're on all major social platforms, including Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Gab, and Getter. Help us get the word out as we cover the biggest topics of our time right here on today's News Talk. TNT Radio. TNT Radio. Now, Mark, you were mentioning how many members of the U.S. government are in attendance, and you also talked about the Logan Act briefly. I remember that was my introduction to the Logan Act, and essentially the Logan Act says that government officials cannot meet in private with these corporate entities outside of the best interests of the United States, and that's an obvious one. Now, it had not been used really in, I I think, over a century until Joe Biden actually penned that down as the way to take down General Michael Flynn, and people learned about the Logan Act. I was taken aback because I never thought it was going to come into play in that regards. Uh, This was something I learned about from Ron Paul. Now, you mentioned all these government officials that are there in capacity uh, as directors of national intelligence and cybersecurity, etc., But then you've got some other ones that are there every single year. And I noticed, you know, you don't have a Mayorkas or a Blinken or anybody at the top officially there. But you do have David Petraeus. And a lot of people have forgotten about David Petraeus. But David Petraeus has now been a part of this organization for well over a decade. And despite uh, being, you know, representing a private organization, think tank, etc., he is very much still involved in the military industrial complex. So break that down, down for us. I'm so glad you brought that up because Petraeus, uh, some people say betray us, that kind of slips off your tongue, but he is a key person there in in terms of the relative frequency that he's there of course he's a former head of the cia he wasn't the director of the cia very long but he is now director of the kkkr global institute and the kk kkr is uh includes henry kravis a longtime bilderberger and his wife marie kravis is not only head of the american friends of bilderberg a new york registered charity which is ridiculous they're not a charity but that's who funds and sets up the american wing of bilderberg and so kkr that global institute um uh henry kravis uh, it, uh marie is his second wife he's a nominal republican she's head not only of the american friends of bilderberg but she is also on the international advisory board of the most powerful branch of the federal reserve and that's the federal reserve bank in new york so marie figures very uh prominently in this and her of course her husband henry leads kkr a co-founder david petraeus is chairman of the kkr global institute and so they don't talk about his wife, uh, Marie Marie uh, Kravis's connections to the Federal Reserve Board, also the Rockefeller Museum of Modern Art. But at any rate, um, uh, David Petraeus is CFR. He's Atlantic Council. He's Aspen Institute. He's Trilateral Commission. I was just taking these notes today. And teaming up with Vance Serchuk, the executive director of the KKR Institute. They have co-written articles in the CFR journal, Foreign Affairs. Uh, Can the U.S. trust the Taliban to prevent another 9-11 is the name of that article that appeared in Foreign Affairs about four years ago, the CFR journal. And so Petraeus is uh, associating with this Vance Serchuk in this KKR entity. And Serchuk was a former national security advisor to Senator Joe Lieberman and a staffer on the Senate Home Secur- Homeland Security Committee. And he worked on Russia sanctions legislation and also the war on terror. And so uh, Petraeus, Petraeus it, it, well, I tell you, you can, you can say it either way, is doing a lot of co- uh, collaboration with Vance Surchuk and another guy, Neil Brown, on the KKK, uh, KKR Global Institute. A lot of details here. And everything is um, very Bilderberg friendly, and it shows why Petraeus is such a um, vital person. And in fact, it came out in Forbes magazine a few years ago, Jason. Why did KKR choose David Petraeus to be um, a, a chairman of a new institute within KKR, the Global Institute, and not just another advisor who's paid as a freelancer. Uh, KKR had had hired 26 or 27 other previous 
advisors that were just advising KKR um, on a casual basis, but they brought in Petraeus and made him the chairman of a whole new uh, global institute within Henry Kravis's KKR. And again, Henry Kravis's wife is big at Bilderberg and so is Henry. And so the reason you would do that is because of Bilderberg. Think about it. Petraeus's connections within Bilderberg would make the ideal would, would be the ideal reason that you would create a new institute within KKR and name Petraeus to be part of that institute and then go to Bilderberg and have all the connections and people he needs to raise the um, uh, reputation of KKR because what was happening was Kravis's a uh, private equity firm, private investment firm, KKR, was starting to take on some baggage, starting to take on a little bit of a, a bad vibe with people. And they needed someone to revive that, to, to give them a little bit better image. Uh, you know, not not so much a black rock uh, piracy image, but something a little cleaner. And so it appears to me that they hired Petraeus, gave him a whole new entity to be the chairman of, and his connections at Bilderberg would be the ideal way to carry out that job, given his other connections formally with the CIA and everything he's done, major commander in the U.S. Army. Um, and this is how Bilderberg works. It's this hyper-networking um, operation that's going to cut all sorts of deals well beyond the, the list of topics that we see. And this is just one person there. Imagine if we looked at all 140 of them and did the same amount of research, which isn't even all that much research. Imagine the uh, labyrinth of connections that we would see. Absolutely. And people really do have to realize that there are meetings within meetings. You talked about um, yes. the possibility of insider trading being through the roof uh, at meetings like this one. I want to remind people or maybe inform people if they don't know that Prince Bernard of the Netherlands, who was a steering committee, committee member and very much a part of Bilderberg for some time in the 70s, was actually forced to step down because he was making uh, insider deals via Lockheed Martin and kickbacks right. via Bilderberg. They were doing arms deals. Now, you know, nothing criminally really ever had, you know, they, they don't put princes in jail. <laughs> Instead, right. he had to ceremoniously step down. And I believe it was his sister, Queen Beatrix of the Netherlands, that would take his spot. I'm not sure if she's there right now, uh, but she was there for decades as well. So you are now, you're not just intermingling with the military industrial complex. You're not just intermingling with the media. You're not just um, intermingling with the political establishment here in the country. You're literally uh, intermingling with establishment fig uh, figures and bloodlines that go back centuries. That's why this is so important. And this is the modern apparatus of compartmentalization, in my opinion. These meetings will lead to other meetings throughout the summer, whether they be with members of the World Economic Forum, members of the media institutions, which in the next segment we'll get into, or other places like Bohemian Grove that are coming up this summer. And you don't have 125 people, you've got 3,000 people. This is how the intermingling uh, intermingling web works of this network of globalization. We got to take a break. We're going to come back. Mark Anderson is our guest. 2024 Bilderberg is happening in Madrid, Spain. Stay tuned as we break into what's really going down over in Spain Town. <laughs> My baby's back from the West Coast. <laughs> Hear those pictures that you asked for for your school project? First day of school, cute as a button. <laughs> so long ago. Oh, here's Grandma Florence after that flood wiped out the whole neighborhood. Sometimes I just cannot believe all the storms we've gone through here. I can only hope that we'll be able to leave this house to you one day, baby. You're our legacy. Planning for these disasters will make sure we're safe. And it's the best way to protect that legacy. <sighs> Those beans smell heavenly. Mm -hmm. Give mom a little credit. You know what? We should make an emergency communication plan. That way we're ready this year. Oh, great idea. At my dorm, we have emergency kits for earthquakes and wildfires, but I'm sure there's something more local I can send you with the link. Okay. Smart. I'm coming to share with you guys. Protect your legacy. Plan for natural disasters today. Visit ready.gov forward slash plan. We come from a long line of farmers and there's a sense of pride. <laughs> But there's also a significant amount of pressure. 
farmers have to take care of their physical and their mental health because what's a farm without a farmer? Watching the sun come up, that's my time. I can have a cup of coffee and every day is a new opportunity. That's cool. Your hands got so cool. Don't forget to check in on yourself. Love your mind. Perception versus the truth. Jason Burmis on today's News Talk TNT. And we are back. We are talking Bilderberg 2024. Now, we already named a couple of media entities that are on the scene, but let's intertwine a couple more with the agendas at hand. We've got a couple different agendas having to do with the economy, and in turn, we also have the editor-in-chief of Bloomberg there and the editor-in-chief of The Economist, uh, two of the foremost, quote-unquote, globalist economic publications out there. When we are looking at the Western economy and we are looking at what's going on in the United States, people aren't happy in general. Uh, they were told that inflation was going to be transitory. A lot of people didn't realize the economic repercussions of taking all those checks and shutting down their businesses during the COVID-1984 nightmare. Uh, people really also have to be prepared that there's a chance this administration just runs through 2024 into 2028, especially given what happened today with Trump's conviction that a lot of people were in denial about. So when we look at the economic future and those in attendance, what do you think we're going to see out of this? In other words, what kind of spin and talking points are we going to be getting on the run-up to this election? Boy, that's a little bit of a tough call, Jason. Um, certainly, <clears throat> it's going to be as anti-Trump as humanly possible. And whatever one might think of Trump, warts and all, when he was in there, he did enact badly needed tariffs against Chinese dumping. He enacted some policies that put some pressure on the Federal Reserve. They didn't get quite the excuse me the publicity they ought to have. They were trying to downplay his accomplishments. He backed us out of the Paris deal uh, right on the eve of Bilderberg 2017 in Virginia. Um, the CFR apparatus, including Richard Haas, a longtime CFR president and chairman, and a sometimes Bilderberger, uh, a, a big apparatchik at CFR. He went all the way to London and spoke to the House of Lords committee. He was so nervous about Trump upending the rules-based world order that he went there and gave kind of a long dissertation on why the, the internationalist establishment was so worried about the United States government under Trump. And the House of Lords committee, uh, somebody got me the video link, which wasn't easy to get, and they listened and heard him out, and he was going through a long uh, dissertation about, about why Trump is a threat to the uh, rules-based international order. And so we're, we're going to see, obviously, at least generally speaking, every way which every way, every which way but loose, you might say, the old saying, uh, to uh, to uh, malign Trump and make him as, quote, unelectable as possible, which the media has already been doing, probably in retaliation for one of the best things Trump did, and that was to call out the media, the fake news, like like no one has ever done before. That's been really one of his best accomplishments is the way he raised the awareness about just how fake the fake news really is. And I don't think the media that you're asking about is ever going to forgive him for, for that totally. And so um, they're going to try and make Trump more persona non grata than they already have, which is almost unbelievable uh, given the lengths they've already went to to do that. And so, you know, we're going to expect... Um, well, for instance, they're saying that uh, Joe Biden is now going to deport more illegals who have illegally entered the United States, and he's going to get tough on immigration. But his numbers are down. And of course, he's going to say that, in my informed opinion, to try and get more undecideds who might see Trump as less viable. And if, if he gets tough uh, at the border and professes to be tough at the border, then maybe that media propaganda and that propaganda out of the White House <clears throat> will be well, you know, it is, it's something we're already seeing, but we're we're bound to see more of that uh, to try and take credit for some of the things that, that Trump has done. You know, the border was probably the most secure it's ever been in at least a quarter century when Trump was in there. And so these are just so many, these are just a few of so many things, uh, Jason, that could come up uh, from the mass media cartel, as I call it. 
And there are about 17 journalists who've sold their souls to Bilderberg that are there this year. So. Absolutely. So let's talk a little bit about 2017, uh, because that's the last time that I covered Bilderberg in person down at Chantilly, Virginia. And I specifically remember that year uh, because Trump had a lot of representation inside via his administration. Uh, for instance, you had people like Peter Thiel, who were on the steering committee. He was his technology secretary. I remember uh, Liddell was there as well, McMasters. They didn't last long in that administration but at the at the same time you know i pointed out he absolutely had a representation in there let's fast forward to now do you see any trump allies on the docket you know i'll go to 2020 and for those that are unaware uh and anybody can go to c-span and check this out for instance michael pompeo came into bilderberg to give a speech on the builder boat uh, where they had the members going to a castle where he was going to give a foreign policy speech, supposedly on tensions with Iran. Now, Jared Kushner was also on the list that year on the Builder boat. So even in 2020, supposed allies of Trump, I would argue that Pompeo was never an ally, and I don't necessarily trust his son-in-law, Jared Kushner, either. But, you know, I went down the line, and I really did not see anybody that was, you know, pro-Trump or any of uh, his his people being represented. What do you what do you got? There's one that's in there that has always been his ally. Robert Lighthizer is there this year, USA. He was a trade advisor in some capacity under Trump. Now he, like usual, there's the revolving door to the private sector, chair of the Center for American Trade, which makes sense, but. You got to remember too that some people only go there once and then they're, they're never invited back as jim tucker often would talk about there are people that they'll try on for size at bilderberg they'll they'll look them over they'll entertain them to be more permanent attendees but they won't typically get asked back it's possible that lighthizer is there to be a fly on the wall for trump to hear what's going on and he's just playing Mr. Neutral. Uh, there's going to be lots of different tactics and reasons that people will go. And, and I doubt that he'll return, but he made his way in there. But the actual significance of that is hard to actually pin down. So we got to be a little careful there. Um, but anyway, let me mention something too, really quickly. Last year at Lisbon, I learned that um, Matthias Dopfner of um, the German um i actual springer that's it the german media yes. outlet actual springer matthias doppner he was taking a walk with zanny mitten bettles the economist who's there all the time mr doffner is becoming a regular and dan dix of press for truth was asking him some miscellaneous questions but then i i decided to get away from those questions and i looked at it a little harder what what's ending up happening is the Economist did a, a puff piece about Matthias Doffner and his foray into the American media market. So as of last year, Doffner and Axel Springer, their main plan, as highlighted through the Economist promotion, was to move their media outlet into the American market. And, and so, into AI, by the way, and yeah. into artificial intelligence, which is key. And, and by the way, yeah. Yeah, Doffner is somebody that has at least been adult enough to engage Dan Dix and the alternative media when they approach him. Uh, he is yeah. a media mogul. People can also check out uh, him interviewing Elon Musk some years ago. I've watched that as well. But when we talk about AI in the media, I think this is really key. Even today, OpenAI, we're going to be going over this story a little later, has now partnered with the Washington Post. They've partnered with Vox. They've already cut deals with uh, the Murdoch media companies to incorporate their news, in other words, their authoritative sources and narrative into chat GPT. So I'm just going to say it again, folks. Garbage in, garbage out. We're not even talking about AI writing articles on behalf. We're now talking about AI regurgitating their narratives as if they are fact through an authoritative software program. This is extremely dangerous. And like I said, Doffner's taken it even further because they're openly talking about AI providing the news as well. Yes, that does not surprise me. I mean, about 10, 12 years ago, there was uh, little blurbs that came up in the news that 
uh, computers were writing small financial reports and the, the financial reports that you'd read in the Wall Street Journal and the Financial Times were not written by human beings. And that was 2015. Can you imagine what it'll be now? Well, I think that we're going even past the idea of just written word. Obviously, uh, the release of yeah, GPT-40, yeah. hello, has given us essentially 90% of her. You know, uh, we're about 10% away from not really being able to tell whether it's human iteration or not. I think we're only maybe two, three years away for that to be uh, accompanied by real-time video as well. The question is... Where are we as a culture by then? Uh, because obviously social media has moved the narrative. This is the next step. Uh, we saw social media, for instance, censor supposedly on behalf of organizations like the World Health Organization, et cetera, also in collusion with the government. And right now we have the move to uh, CAIOs, chief AI officers in all government departments and any uh, companies or corporations of note. These are going to have guardrails, uh, Mark. In other words, there are certain things that you will be able to program and will not be able to program into the software. Plus, they are fully audited. These chief uh, um, artificial intelligence officers are going to have to have a certain clearance uh, via classified programs. I think it's a TSIC uh, 15 or above. And then, like I said, the only entities that are not going to be fully audited are the intel communities and uh, the Department of Defense. And then they have, um, they have workarounds or loopholes for their military industrial complex subsidiaries, a.k.a. Google and the other tech companies that are working with them. Now, Eric Schmidt is another one of these guys that is a complete staple. Uh, some people might even say uh, he is the opposite of Peter Thiel, who's supposed to be the libertarian guy. I think they're both authoritarian. Um, this is uh, Schmidt's book from over a decade ago, The New Digital Age, in which he wrote that with Jared Cohen, uh, another CFR and Bilderberg attendee. I don't know that he is there this year. What are your thoughts on Schmidt? Because in his uh, quote unquote unofficial capacity, they're talking about you know his work with uh, Google, obviously Alphabet, but this is a guy that's worked with the National Security Council, is still very much in play and influential. What's Schmidt's role on there? Well, I mean, generally speaking, it's pretty clear that he's one of the leading uh, guys to carry the water, <clears throat> excuse me, for big tech. Um, and Bilderberg gives him the uh, networking and ideas, uh, both the ideas he gives others and others give him uh, to move forward, to put the world in this digital straitjacket, which serves to uh, provide even deeper surveillance, to expand AI in the ways you're talking about, which are very dystopian largely and scary. I mean, AI could have reasonable limit limited applications where it might do some good but i don't see that coming out of people like this uh they want this total information awareness that the intelligence community used to talk about and uh schmidt is you know just generally speaking is just a major apparatchik to make all that happen uh you you have people from deep mind there and microsoft and of course palantir uh, a couple years ago, right before the D.C. Bilderberg in 2022, uh, Car Alex Karp was over in Ukraine setting up some sort of um, military uh, surveillance and command system using AI. And uh, it, only a few months after the so-called Russian invasion. So um, this is very plugged in across many venues. And, and it's notable that there's two AI topics, not one, but two this year the state of AI and AI safety right at the very top of the 13 topics. So uh, that's interesting. And of course, we can't forget with Albert Borla there, uh, just as a footnote, that the World Economic, excuse me, the World Health Assembly is having their World Health, uh, excuse me, the World Health Assembly of the WHO is meeting now. They began this past Monday. There's so many WH this and WE that's out there. They, they started meeting in Geneva, Switzerland this past Monday. They conclude June 1st or 2nd. They're trying to hammer out this very um, troublesome pandemic treaty and in the international health regulations. So uh, that's got to be weighing heavily on Albert Borla in terms of what influence he might try and um, promulgate through Bilderberg Connections to try and get the WHA, that assembly, 
to get that uh, treaty in place because what that will do is give big pharma even more all-encompassing world power to peddle their products and to try and squelch any criticism or so-called disinformation about big pharma. So not only do we have the big tech problem, we have the big pharma problem, and Trump is being convicted as we speak, and that World Health Assembly is also taking place as we speak. Uh, and as you mentioned at the beginning, Jason, it's a very pivotal year, and that's some of the reasons it's so pivotal. And with all of these organizations, uh, the public, at least a large part of them, larger than I've ever seen, has at least awoken to the idea of globalism, the quote unquote great reset yeah. agenda, which right. is really a repackaged new world order agenda. And they are now familiar with the World Economic Forum and Davos. And we now have um, the announcement that Klaus Nutschwab is going to be uh, stepping down as the chair. He will still have a uh, seat there, but he, he'll still be on the committee. He won't be the chair anymore. Do you think that this is really the repackaging of the World Economic Forum? Was he just too much of a Bond villain to fit? And how do we get more people to learn about Bilderberg, which I believe is really the more important organization, while the World Economic Forum itself is the mouthpiece for that agenda? Boy, I don't know. I, I mean, publicity is always the main thing, and that's what alternative media like us try to do. Um, there's been some speculation as to which which is the tail and which is the dog, World Economic Forum and Bilderberg. I mean, World Economic Forum is not as old as Bilderberg. Bilderberg started in 1954, 70 years ago. This is their 70th meeting, was seeded with CIA money. And that's according to a reliable British professor, Richard Aldrich, uh, with Warwick University at the time. So CIA money started Bilderberg. That's obviously very significant. And um, uh, to get more people aware of Bilderberg. Of course, they mitigate against that by announcing, at least finalizing where they're going to meet, when they're going to meet, and who's going to be there and what they're going to talk about, waiting until the first day of Bilderberg, and that's today through June 2nd, today being May 30th. They do everything they can to squelch publicity to reduce the number of people who could, who have the time and the wherewithal and the money to get over there and cover it in person. So it's always an uphill battle, but we are also gaining uh, audience through TNT, through UK Column that I report for every Monday. We are gaining audiences and their their media, their mass media cartel is losing audiences. So whether we attend Bilderberg and all that, we've got, I believe, the ascendancy on our side. And at CNN, New York Times, all of them are losing circulation, losing viewers largely. There's some variations to that, but not very many. And I think we can take heart that on a broader scale that our media brand is beginning to resonate with people and people are tired of the legacy media altogether. So that that's really the, the ray of hope that I see. And I hope that at least partially answers your question, Jason. That does, Mark. Thank you so much for joining us. And shout out to those on the ground, Charlie Skelton, Dan Dix, and Josh Friedman, bringing us the truth from Bilderberg 2024. Mark, we will catch up soon. 